dads in the room. I've sat with I've sat with people who are in their 50s and 60s, and they say to me, "I never once heard my dad say he was sorry. I never once saw my dad humble. I never once had my dad come to me and say, "Hey, I, I blew it. Do you forgive me?" So you have an opportunity to break that chain and to lead your families with humility. Husbands and wives, go to each other. Say, hey, I was wrong. I shouldn't have said that. I shouldn't have treated you that way. Be the first. You want to be first? I always want to be first. Jesus says, be first. Be first to pick up the towel and pick up the base and begin to wash feet. What does that look like in your life? What does that look like? My prayer today is that conflict that's existed for years would be resolved. Thank you, Gabriel, and thank you to all of our students. One of the things we believe and say here at Boulder Mountain, our students are not the future church, they're part of the church today. And today is an example of that. We're so grateful that every week we have students serving in children's ministry, they're serving in tech, they're serving in, in different environments throughout the church. They are part of the church today. We're on a series called For All Kinds, and we're looking every week at a specific characteristic that Paul writes about in Colossians chapter 3. The theme of Colossians, over and over and over, you hear Paul talking about to put on, to put on. Like you're getting dressed, what do you put on? Clothe yourselves. This is the the original language. He's saying clothe yourselves. What are the characteristics that a follower of Jesus is to be wearing as you go throughout your day, as you impact your community, and as you lead your homes? What are the characteristics? Put on then, as Gabriel just read, your holy and beloved. You're chosen. What do you wear? Last week we looked at compassion. To be a follower of Jesus means you see a need and you meet it. You know the price and you pay it and you don't talk yourself out of it. And if you missed last week, can go on and listen to week one of the series. Today might be, I know you're going to be like every pastor says this every week, it might be the most important week of the series. If you only get one week out of this series, I'm glad you're here today. It is the most important characteristic of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And I don't think it's even close. So if, if there's one, it is this one. And it is humility. It is humility. For to receive the good news of Jesus requires humility. It requires for us to be humble. I think we would agree with God on this. God opposes the proud, if you've ever heard that. Whether you grew up in church or or not, I think every person that you would talk to would agree with that statement. Yeah, me too. I oppose the proud. I don't like being around proud people, and that's probably true for you too. We've all got stories, right? There was the guy at work. There was the person at school when you were growing up. There was that kid on the team, the proud person, right? We oppose that. We don't like to be around that. God says, I oppose the proud, but I give grace to the humble. What does it mean to have, to have humility? Today we're going to look at the diagnosis of pride, the opposite of humility. We're going to look at the destructiveness of it, and then we're going to look finally We'll look at the antidote. What is the solution to a proud heart? What is it? C.S. Lewis describes pride is ruthless, sleepless, unsmiling concentration of the self by C.S. Lewis. The Bible does not necessarily tell us specifically when we have questions about life and how to do life and should I take this job? Should I marry this person? Where do I go to college? What should I, should I stay on the team or not? The Bible's not going to speak specifically to those very specific decisions that you have to make in your life. But the Bible has a lot to say about the type of person that we are to be. The type of person that you and I are to be 
compassionate, kind, humble, meek, and patient. And actually throughout scripture, the Bible describes three types of people. Three types of people. Proverbs really zeroes in on this, but the first one, a wise person, right? Who, who in the room wouldn't want to be wise? The second type of person the Bible clearly identifies as, is a fool. Now, wise people make foolish decisions, but they learn from it and they, they remain wise, right? But a fool continues to make the same decision over and over and over and over again. Wise, fool, and the third category is evil. There are three types of people described all throughout the Bible. There's a wise person, there's a foolish person, and there's an evil person. There are people, believe it or not, this might be hard for some of us to understand, who seek harm on your behalf. They are out to get you. They would want nothing more than to see you fall and to see you fail. And they're going to do everything they can to get ahead of you. What is pride? Pride is not just enjoying the pleasures of this world for yourself. It's more than that. It's making sure you have more of it than somebody else. It's not just I'm being concerned about my looks or my grades or my place on the team or my position in the play. It's more than that. It's as long as I am uh, above somebody else. As long as I have more than somebody else, then I'm doing okay. That would be called, my friends, an over-superiority complex, a superiority complex. As long as I'm doing better with them, I'm okay. It's, I'm grading on the curve with every person I meet and every relationship I have. Well, I know I've, I'm not the best parent, but I'm better than that parent. We ever thought that? I know I'm not doing everything right, but boy, I'm a lot better than this family. That's superiority client complex. And some of us in the room, we go the other way. And we think, man, I, I'm failing at everything in life. Woe is me. Nothing's gone right. My life is broken. And there is, I've never had a good fortune in my life. Maybe for some of us in the room, that's, that's where we lean. We don't lean on the superiority complex. We lean on the inferiority complex. And if I can say oh so gently, both of them are rooted in pride even inferiority, right? Why am I so down on myself? Because I want to feel better about myself. I want to do better. I want to compare myself to everybody. I want to be farther ahead than somebody else, and I'm not, so I have inferiority. A follower of Jesus, right? Where are we going today? A follower of Jesus has humility and boldness at the same time. You're like, how, how is that possible? How is that possible? I'm humble, right? As a follower of Jesus, you, you think about humility. It's one of the characteristics that as soon as you bring it up and start talking about it in terms of your own self, it vanishes. It disappears as soon as you start talking about humility, right? I'm a really competitive person, just to let you in on, on me as a person. I mean, I can turn everything into a competition, which didn't bode so well early in marriage. Everything was a competition, putting away dishes, folding socks, and then I'd shoot it into the drawer, right? You, you shoot your dirty laundry into the basket. Anybody else relate to that? Everything was a competition, and if I'm not careful, everything can be a competition. And the danger in that is we're always keeping score, always keeping score. There's one thing that you need to receive the good news of Jesus. There's only one thing. And some of you are already thinking, I didn't think you had to have anything. I didn't think we brought anything to the table. There's one thing that all of us need to bring when it comes to the gospel. And that is nothing. Nothing. When we come to receive the grace and the mercy that God has for us, I don't bring anything to it. Because if, if I have a superiority complex, I'm like, well, of course God's going to love me. I mean, I'm all that. I mean, I, I'm, I'm a pretty good guy, right? I mean, yeah, I've made some mistakes, but God, God wants me on his team. He's going to pick me, of course, right? It's a dangerous, dangerous place to be. We are all incomplete, oftentimes trying to earn our salvation. 
And we go throughout life trying to find someone we're better at and remind ourselves and at times we remind them that we're better at. And pride needs to take God's place. Pride takes God's place in our life. A.W. Tozer says, when we place God in his rightful place, a thousand problems are resolved. When we put God where God deserves to be in our life, so many things become clear in, in our life. And we're thinking, maybe when I started describing pride, we're thinking, oh, I know somebody, and a bunch of people came to mind, proud people. It's important for us all in the room, all in the room today to admit, yeah, I've, I've been proud. I've got, a, I've got an ego. He does too. He's, that's an amen, Right? We all have an ego. A couple of questions I thought about this week. Maybe a little test. You don't need to tell anybody. You don't need to make eye contact with anybody. You can just in your own heart. A couple of questions to ask. Am I a proud person? Am I easily offended? Are you offended by really petty things? It could be the result of a proud heart. I have seen people... I've seen relationships ended. I've seen people leave the church because they were offended over something so small. Somebody walked by them and didn't say hi to them. You know how many times I'm not even aware? I, I need to be told. Am I easily offended? First question. Second question is, am I able to have a conversation with somebody and talk all about myself and never once ask them about how they're doing. You know, a healthy conversation, there's give and take. Let me tell you about your day, my day. I can tell you about your day. I'll tell you about my day. You tell me about your day. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take some time to ask about you. All of us in the room, we all have the same favorite subject. It's me. We all do. It's our favorite subject. Talk about me, Right? It feels good when somebody asks you about you. Paul says, my beloved, you're chosen. Put on humble clothes. Put on humility. Every meeting you walk into, every conflict you have in your life, here's the reality of every conflict Jesus tells us in Matthew 7, 3 through 5. You see the speck in somebody else's eye. And Jesus, the greatest storyteller ever to live, says, but you have a two-by-four sticking out of your, your head. Do you get the visual picture? I mean, I picture a wooden ladder coming out of somebody's head. And they're focused on a speck of dust in somebody else's head. Every time, my friend, every time there's conflict, there's two parties involved. Now, it, now, one person might, it might be majority one person. It might be 99% one person. That means I have 1%, or I might be the 99%, right? And when I come to have that conversation, I must enter with a humble heart. I must enter that conversation, be willing to admit that I have made mistakes, that I was wrong. Here's how I was wrong. And not just I am sorry, but do you forgive me? Now, we're not going to spend a lot of time on forgiveness because that's in the verse as well that we'll get to. There'll be a whole week on forgiveness. But let me just give you a little spoiler alert, okay? A little teaser. What does forgiveness mean? You have to get to the forgiveness part. It is not enough to simply say, I'm sorry. Forgiveness means debt's been paid. And I will never, ever bring it up and lord it over you again as long as I live. Does it mean we forget? No, because we're humans and we don't forget. God says, I'll forget your sin. I'll remember it no more, he says about our sin. But when it comes to human conflict, we're going to remember it. But forgiveness means I will, I will never remind you of this again. I will not, next time this happens, I won't bring it up. Forgiveness means debt's been paid. But to get there requires humility. It requires humility. I enter into that room, 
humility. I was wrong. I'm going to start. Anybody else competitive in the room likes to be first? Here's where we get to be first. Jesus says, you want to be first? Then you go first. You want to be first? You're the first one to take the step toward reconciliation. And we're all wrestling with different people, right? Sometimes two wise people sit down with humility. That problem solved in three minutes when there's humility involved on both sides. It's a little more difficult when you have a wise person and a foolish person. That's, that's more difficult. It's still possible. But every time two people, even two Christians sit down together, it's two sinners sitting down to resolve conflict. And it requires humility, a humble heart. A humble heart. God leans toward the humble all throughout Scripture. I, I could tell you stories, dozens and dozens and dozens of stories. It's not always the firstborn son who gets the inheritance. Throughout Scripture, God leans toward the lower son. It's not always, in fact, rarely is it the most beautiful woman who gets, who gets the guy. God shows up. Right? I mean, story after story after story. The proud man's house, Proverbs says, is destroyed, but the widow's house will remain strong. There is, God leans toward the lowly. He leans toward those who recognize that I am in need of a Savior. I am desperate. I am broken. And I've got absolutely nothing. God is inclined to lean toward the person who admits it, who owns it. The destructiveness of pride. The Bible tells us if there was a parade going down your street, the first float would be pride and the very next float is destruction. The Bible guarantees that. Here comes destruction, but there's also in the same parade where there is humility. Where there is humility, there is there is wisdom. Pride breeds quarrels, but wisdom leads to advice. He tears the proud man's house, but he keeps the widow's house intact. Jesus was the most humble person to ever walk this planet. But he was also the strongest person to ever walk this planet. He was strong enough to be weak. What does it mean? To be a follower of Jesus? What does it mean to be a fully devoted disciple of Jesus? It means you are willing to go first and say, I was wrong. I own it. Listen, we all have stories in this room of broken family relationships, of broken relationship friendships for years were broken over something. And each person's waiting for somebody else to go first. Jesus was strong enough to be weak. You see, Jesus, Jesus was first. He did that for you. He was strong enough to learn for us to be strong enough to learn from our mistakes, to be strong enough to do the right thing. If any of us in the room today, the Bible teaches on this subject of humility, if any of us in this room think that we are not conceited, it means we are very conceited indeed. If there's anybody in this room who thinks, I am not proud, Go home and do some work with God today. God resists the proud. We all do. We've all been around people, self-absorbed. All they do is talk about themselves. God gives grace to the humble. He's much more inclined to say yes to a humble request. What's the antidote for pride? We all need the antidote. I already mentioned the important theme in the Bible. God loves the widow. He loves the poor. He loves the outsider. He loves the weak. He loves the underdog. And that is good news for all of us in the room. We feel like we don't measure up. For those of us who've lost in the struggle for position and power and looks, he's for you. He's for the wise. He's for the fatherless. He's for the weak. John 17, which I would call is the actual Lord's Prayer. I know, 
I know there's another passage, our Father who art in heaven. We call that the Lord's Prayer. But if we really want to know what the Lord's Prayer is, it's John 17. It's where Jesus, one-on-one, alone with his Father, praying. It's called the high priestly prayer, John chapter 17. This is what he says. He says, glorify them in the same way you have glorified me. The position that Jesus had in heaven. God, the Trinity, what was the Trinity doing? The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit before we all came along? What were they doing? They were glorifying each other. One was glorifying the other two. Each one of them was doing that. Perfect relationship, perfect unity, never conflict. And what does Jesus say? In his prayer before he goes to the cross, he says, Father, would you glorify them? Put on them the crown of honor and the crown of glory. Has said, put that on top of them. For they are made a little lower than the angels. They are made with glory and honor. There's, there's a passage. I take you to Jesus, John chapter 13. He's the most powerful person who's ever walked this earth, right? If anybody could, could say and, and was deserving of power, And to wear a crown, it was Jesus. If anyone had the right to be proud, it was was Jesus. In John chapter 13, it's one of the most beautiful passages, and you've you've heard it before, but I want to just focus on what Jesus did in John chapter 13. It's before he goes to the cross. He... He's gathered together. He has to find a secret room because everybody's out to get him. They're looking for him. Spies are out. They're trying to find where Jesus is. In fact, one of the 12, they've already cut a deal to capture him later that night. But in John 13, Jesus, when he recognized that the Father had given him all power, all power, what does he do? He lays it down. What does it mean to be humble? It means you... you, when you have power, when you have influence, when you have the ability to do something for yourself, you also have the willingness to lay it down. And Jesus gave it all up. He had all the cards. The father at John chapter 13, it was like he was giving him the keys to the car. And the father steps back. Jesus, it's your, your call. What are you going to do? And there's a it's after, it's after describing what happens in John 13. There's a little passage. There's something else going on in the room. Jesus, when he recognized that the Father had given him all power, what does he do with it? When you recognize that you've got a leg up on somebody else, when, when it looks like you're going to get the job, when it looks like there's, you're in competition with somebody else, what do you do in that moment? There's some really influential people in this room. God has given you influence. God has given you ability to make decisions. God's given you, quote, unquote, power. I know we don't like to use that word, but that's what it is. When Jesus recognized that God had given him all power, what did he do? He, he stood up. They were not all sitting in chairs. The Bible tells us in John 13, they were reclining. They were on the floor. And they were leaning on their, probably their left elbow. They're eating with their other hand. Their legs are kind of laying down. Their legs kind of are behind them. They're doing this in a circle. And Jesus stands up in that moment when he recognized that he's the most powerful person in the world. What does he do? He doesn't leverage his influence for his own power and his own gain. He takes off his rabbinical robe. Rabbis, my friend, did not wash feet. But he took off his robe. And he began washing each one of their feet. He washed the feet of traitors. He washed the feet of cowards. He washed the feet of deniers, and he goes around the room. What is he doing? He's leveraging his power and his influence because he knew that these men in the room, most of them, are going to be a really big deal one day. They weren't that day, but Jesus is modeling for them. This is what it means. This is what you're to do. When you have power, you give it away. You lay it down for others, and he begins to wash He begins to wash their feet. Every time they came for Jesus, they wanted to make him a king. In John chapter 6, they wanted to put a crown on his head. And what what does he do? He got out of there. 
He went to the wilderness by himself. He resisted the power. He did not come to take life. He came to give, to give life away. John 13, 12, Jesus says, do you understand what I've just done for you? John 13, 15, Jesus says, you should have done for you. Go and do the same. Go and do the same. What does it mean to be a follower of Jesus? We go first. We go first when it comes to being humble. Jesus lived his life, my life for you. If we're honest, we wake up in the morning and we go throughout the day, your life for me, right? If we're honest. I don't need anybody to tell me to think about myself every day. It just happens naturally. Jesus says there's a better way. There's another way. Go and do what I have done. Live your life, my life for you. What does it mean for you to have humility in your life? What if parents parented their kids with that type of humility? I'm going to lay down my influence. I'm going to lay down my power. I'm going to serve you. What would that look like if husbands served their wives that way, if wives served their husbands that way, if, if employers served their employees that way? I'm, I'm not going to take credit. I'm going to give it away. I'm going to recognize others. What does humility look like? Are there relationships in your life that God is just simply asking for some humility to show up and say, own what you can. Don't own what isn't what you what you can't own. But own your part. And there's enough of that to own. Right? Sit down and say, I was wrong. Let me let me tell you about where I was wrong. I was wrong. This is this is how I hurt you. And I'm sorry, and I'm asking for forgiveness. It's a proud person who lives a proud life with a hard heart cannot accept the gospel because the gospel requires humility. We have to recognize that we cannot save ourselves, that we are in desperate need of a Savior, and I have to admit it, that I... I'm in need. God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Humility is the currency that God works in. And it's, it's a daily prayer. Every day, you must wake up and, and pray, God, I need you today. I'm broken. I'm weak. I don't know what to do most of the time. I need your grace. I'm not deserving of it. If you've never said that prayer to God, there may be some really proud people in the room. God can soften your heart. And you can look back and you can look at relationships that have gone south and, and maybe, I don't know, I'm not the Holy Spirit, but listen to the Holy Spirit as the Holy Spirit's talking to you. Maybe the common denominator of all the conflict in your life is you, right? And to own that, because that's the reality. In all the conflict of my life, guess, guess who's been a part of that? Me. And in every one of those, I own a piece of that. And it takes, it takes great humility to lower yourself, to lower yourself before another person, say, I, I'm sorry. I don't know who needs to hear that today. I don't know what conflict exists in your life. Paul's saying here in Colossians 3, when, when there are two truly devoted followers of Jesus, there are no irreconcilable differences. Why? Because we're called to, to humble ourselves. There is humility at work. Dad's in the room. I've sat, with, I've sat with people who are in their 50s and 60s, and they say to me, 
I never once heard my dad say he was sorry. I never once saw my dad humble. I never once had my dad come to me and say, hey, I, I blew it. Do you forgive me? So you have an opportunity to break that chain and to lead your families with humility. Husbands and wives, go to each other. Say, hey, I was wrong. I shouldn't have said that. I shouldn't have treated you that way. Be the first. You want to be first? I always want to be first. Jesus says, be first. Be first to pick up the towel and pick up the base and begin to wash feet. What does that look like in your life? What does that look like? My prayer today is that conflict that's existed for years would be resolved. And I tell you what, because this has happened in my, with my siblings. There were seven of us kids. There was always somebody crying growing up, right? And as we became adults, it didn't change. There's always conflict. But now, now we're at peace. And it is better than it's ever been, right? After reconciliation, relationships get better because you've been through some things. There is a sweetness to a reconciled family. There's sweetness to a reconciled marriage. There is, there is a sweetness that cannot be described when two friends are at conflict or they're at enmity, they're at war, and they come back together. I pray that. I pray that for you. I pray that for our church. I pray that for your family and your marriage. But I can't control anybody else. But I can bring, I can control me. So when I walk into that room, I can bring humility. That doesn't mean I get to dictate how that meeting goes. But I can bring humility. And you can bring humility. I'm sorry. I was wrong. This is how I hurt you. Do you forgive me? And it's, and then you live in the freedom and the peace of that as you move forward. My dearly beloved, holy and chosen, Paul writes, put on compassion, kindness, and humility. And we'll keep going through this series. I invite you to memorize Colossians 3, 12 through 14. What does it mean to be a fully devoted follower of Jesus? There's some powerful characteristics there. I believe our families would change, our our schools would change, our communities would change. If Christians were known, oh, they're that humble group. They're humble. You ever been around a really humble person? Final thought. The grill is going. You ever been around a really humble person? There's just a happiness about them. They're not trying to prove themselves. They're not trying to get ahead. They're not trying to tell you how amazing they are. There's just a joy and a happiness, and they're okay with whatever happens. I hope, I hope there's some humble people in your life you can be around, you can observe, and you can watch. And may, by God's grace, we all move a little more on that scale toward humility today. Would you pray with me? Father, I thank you that Jesus, although the greatest, most powerful person to ever walk this earth, he had all the cards, he could do whatever he wanted to do, and yet he went first and he gave his life away. And the reward was us. That was the reward. And Father, I pray anybody who has not received that, anybody in the room who's never admitted that I am in need of a Savior, that today would be the day that they would say that, that they would do business with you, God, that they would bring the only thing that's required, and that is nothing. We would simply receive the grace and the mercy that he offers all of us today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I want to take a moment to say thank you for joining us for today's service online. I'm going to invite you to our website where there are a number of different action steps to take following today's service. Maybe joining a small group or finding a place to serve or 
sending a prayer request into the church to let us know how we can help you and how we can be praying for you. If you found this message today encouraging and supportive, I'm going to ask you to like or share or comment and let us know and and share that with your friends. If it's been an encouragement to you, I trust you'll be an encouragement to others as you share this resource. Hey, we've been praying for you. We're going to continue to pray for you throughout this week and trust you'll join us again next weekend. Have a great week.